Welcome to the Fellows Library at Jesus College in Oxford. This room was finished nearly 350 years ago in 1679 and today the shelves are full with over 10,000 early printed books. Uh, our oldest book printed in 1467 and the college owns even older medieval manuscripts which are now in the Bodleian Library. Three 17th century principals of the college Powell, Mansell and Jenkins left the collections which they'd accumulated over their lifetimes to Jesus for the use of the college. We also received several hundred books from a man called Edward Herbert of Cherbury. So this room had to be built to house the extended collections. And what a handsome room it is that we have now, essentially unchanged from 1679 until it was restored in 2007 with generous contributions from our former students and others. And the library is used today both for our fellows as a place to work and think. Also, we hold exhibitions and seminars for current Jesus students who have the chance to handle the books which they might have been studying in their original form. And we are also open to research visitors who can discover our collections online and visit from around the world. And originally these books were chained to the shelves, so that's to say there would have been a chain attaching each of the book's covers to a rod on the bookcase so that it couldn't be taken any further than the hard wooden desks at which our fellows had to sit and read. That's no longer the case, but it's still the case that these books remain in the fellows library, except on occasion when we lend them for exhibitions. A 17th century fellow coming into the Fellows Library today would recognise their surroundings. Some of the significant books that we're privileged to hold in this collection include a first edition of Isaac Newton's Principia Mathematica, um, a first edition of William Harvey's De Motu Cordis, and a second folio of William Shakespeare's works. So here in the Fellows Library, there are 18 of these double-sided bookcases projecting from each of the walls and windows between them to let in the light. It's also on two floors and there's a, a marvellous spiral, wooden spiral staircase at the end of the library and that leads up to a gallery with another 20 or so bays of books. And one of our duties is to keep them both for current users and for posterity. The way we do that is through keeping the library cold. And you'll see that when we handle these books we usually don't use gloves. You might be used to seeing people wearing white cotton gloves on television, but here our advice is that those gloves remove the sensitivity from your fingertips. And of course that's the way that these books would have been read throughout the centuries. And finally, Jesus College is lucky to be a member of the Oxford Conservation Consortium. So we have access to a group of expert conservators who can both advise us and repair any books which have been damaged over the centuries. I'm Sue Doran. I'm a Senior Research Fellow at Jesus College and I'm also a Professor of Early Modern British History at the University of Oxford. What I want to talk to you today about is Edward Herbert, Lord Charbery. And he's important for Jesus College, not because he was an undergraduate here, in fact he was an undergraduate at University College, but because he left in his will all his Latin and Greek books and manuscripts to Jesus College. We don't know exactly why he did that, probably because as a, from a, a Welsh, Anglo-Welsh family, he saw Jesus as the Welsh College and thought that they should have this collection to build up their very new library, the Fellows Library. It's also possible that he knew the principal then and thought that this would be an appropriate place or was persuaded to think this would be an appropriate place for his Latin and Greek works. In fact, the fellows of Jesus at that time were rather disappointed because they'd hoped that he would also give his extensive collection of modern books, books in the vernacular and in European languages to the college as well. But that was not to be. He left that to his heir and it was for a long time in his uh, castle in Wales. Now, the book that I want to talk to you about today is the book that he wrote and left in manuscript at his death um, on the life of King Henry VIII. We can see it here. It was indeed published 
in 1649, a year after his death, so he left it only in manuscript. He wrote it um, at the request of King Charles I in the 1630s. Charles was embarking on policies that had annoyed, greatly annoyed his Protestant subjects, and he thought that commissioning a life of King Henry, who had broken with Rome and was the first of the monarchs taking England down a new religious course, would somehow explain his own policies, because in religion, Henry VIII was conservative, not in exactly the same direction as Charles I, but one could perhaps make a parallel. Edward, Lord Herbert, was not his first choice to write this, this history. Um, Herbert was not known as a historian. He had written a very important philosophical work. He'd written uh, works that um, did not show that he could write a solid history. Uh, in fact, Charles's first choice was Francis Bacon. But nevertheless, Lord Charbury did a, what I think is a really good job. It's the first scholarly life of Henry VIII. And what marks it out is that he was able to avoid presenting Henry as either a Protestant hero or as a villain uh, in the way that Catholics were uh, writing about him earlier and around that time. What Charbery wants to do here is provide a history that is, is more secular in its orientation, which is more ecumenical in its approach. And both at the beginning of the book and at the end of the book, where he provides his conclusions on Henry, Charbery provides a really quite balanced view of the king. He talks about him as being a man who began his reign uh, as a virtuous king with many good qualities, and he made a good mark at the beginning of his reign in the French wars but that he was led astray by two, as it were, fatal flaws. One was his readiness to listen to evil counsellors. Cardinal Wolsey was, of course, a, a case in point. Um, and the other was that he was inclined to be suspicious, and he would listen to people who would tell him stories, for example, about Anne Boleyn, that she had been unfaithful to him. So... Charbery won't make a, won't commit himself as to whether the stories of Anne Boleyn were correct or not, though the implication is that they weren't. But that Henry was prepared to listen to these stories um, is is what marks him out as far as Charbery is concerned as someone who is not making his own judgments and is inclined to go in policies through emotion, which results in him ending up in the words he uses cruel. He doesn't think Henry was a tyrant uh, because Henry uh, did act within the law. And he's always very keen to point out that everything that Henry did, the break of Rome, dissolution of the monasteries, etc., were done with the consent of Parliament, the voice of the people as it was then. So for Charbery, the life of Henry VIII was not going to show a way forward for Charles I, and maybe that's why it wasn't published in um, Charbery's own, own lifetime, but that it was going to be a, a kind of a, an objective history of the king, one that had not been written before. But the great contribution to Jesus College is not this book. It wasn't left with his, within his will. It was acquired afterwards. Um, but the great collection of Latin and Greek works and the manuscripts that Charbery decided to donate to the college and was given to the college on his death in 1648. The Fellows Library has so many treasures. It has books from the medieval times to the 21st century. But the one I wanted to talk about today is a royal book. These are the works of King James I. This is the first time a British monarch has a collection of his works printed. And King James was an accomplished political writer, poet, religious polemicist. He was a great rhetorician. This is the King of England, who comes from Scotland, who is the son of Mary, Queen of Scots, 
um, executed by Elizabeth, he succeeds Queen Elizabeth on England's throne in 1603. He had been writing and publishing a lot during his time as King of Scotland. He was known as James VI of Scotland. He was known as the Cradle King. He had been crowned shortly after the um, deposition of his mother, Mary Stuart, and her flight to England. So James publishes his poems in a volume called Essays of Apprentice in 1584, when he's a teenager still. Um, he published he publishes a big poem about the victory of the Christians against the Turks. It was a big naval battle, the Battle of Lepanto. He was publishing a lot of um, works which were both political and religious as King of Scotland. And you could think of those as kind of um, veiled job applications, suggesting to the English that he would be a good King of England. You couldn't discuss the succession. And obviously, as a Scot, um, although he is an accomplished writer, uh, his writing can be uh, full of Scotticisms. So certainly for an English audience, it might appear not terribly um, sophisticated or civilized. And when these works are published in 1616, so 13 years after his accession to the English throne, a lot of the diction is actually anglicized. And what we also get are um, marginal references in the various works to classical or scriptural authorities. So the book appears much more authoritative, imposing, serious. And we don't have the poems here for which he was quite famous. So here we have a table of contents which is entitled The Several Treatises According to the Time Wherein They Were Written and Their Place in This Collection. So it's a chronological arrangement of the contents. And it starts with the paraphrase upon the Revelation, Meditations on the Bible, his tract called Demonology, which was about witches, Basilican Dorum, which was a book of advice to his eldest son, Prince Henry, um, who had died um, and was succeeded as the heir to the throne by Prince Charles. The True Law of Free Monarchies, a political tract, a counterblast to tobacco, which I mentioned to you before, a discourse of the powder treason, which is the account of the gunpowder plot, and many others. So you will see that his, uh, that the king's poetry is not included in this book. It's his political and religious writings and the um, uh, tract against witches and the tract um, against tobacco, as well as his speeches to parliament. Now, this is a stunning book, and we happen to know when it came to the Jesus Library. It was part of a collection of Francis Mansell, who had been a three-time principal of Jesus. He was a great royalist. He was closely connected with King Charles I, to whom, uh, as prince, this book is dedicated. And when he was expelled from the principalship in 1649, after the king's um, execution, he donated his book collection to the Jesus Library, and it included this book. But it's a very interesting story because the book, we know, had belonged to George Villiers, Duke of Buckingham, who had been a favorite of both King James I and King Charles I. He was a great patron of the arts. He was a great dancer. And there were suspicions of almost inappropriate relationship between King James and Buckingham. Many disliked him. They thought that he was a corrupting influence of the, on the king. But um, he managed to survive the transition to the new reign in 1625. And he became a friend and favorite of King Charles I. But the public outcry against him was so great that he was actually assassinated. We have no idea how Principal Mansell 
acquired a copy of King James's works which had belonged to Buckingham, but it was his donation of the book to Jesus that accounts for its provenance. That's why we have it. And the last thing I wanted to say is that here we have a monarch who publishes his works in this impressive folio format in 1616 and it is in the same year that the first collections collection of plays in England is published also in the folio format by Ben Johnson and this is the book that we're looking at you can see that it has a similar engraved frontispiece to that of the works of King James but unlike uh, King James's works, although the format is supposedly the same, this is a much smaller book actually, and the binding is much less impressive than the gorgeous vellum of the King's book. And finally, we also have a copy of another collection of plays. Shakespeare's works were for the first part time published in a collected edition several years after both these, in 1623. That's when the first folio of Shakespeare appears. And uh, Jesus, unfortunately, doesn't have a copy of the first folio, but we do have a copy of the second one, which was printed in 1632. And Shakespeare's is not called works. It's called Mr. William Shakespeare's Comedies, Histories and Tragedies, and instead of an engraved frontispiece, we only have the likeness of the author. And it's wonderful to have access to these books in the Jesus Library, because it means that whether one teaches history or literature or book history, we can bring our students, undergraduates and graduates to the library and showcase these holdings. They are allowed to touch them. And I think that really makes a big difference for their understanding of early modern literature, politics and culture.